Welcome to St. Francis College and the uh, Power of Entrepreneurship panel. Um, Dennis has told me if you feel like you need to tweet this morning, you, you use the uh, use the hashtag. Okay, so he wants uh, he wants to get all those hits. He's measuring the statistics. So uh, this morning, it's uh, it's my honor to introduce to you our, our moderator for the panel, um, Mr. Steve Mariotti. Steve's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, so don't hold that against him. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Michigan, where he also got his master's degree. And after a successful business career, Steve decided to do something completely different. He became a special education teacher here in New York City. And not just any place in New York City, but some pretty tough places in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Uh, it was while he was teaching that he realized what truly motivated the toughest students, and he founded the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, a nonprofit organization that has seen over 600,000 students pass through its program. That's an amazing number. Steve's also a best selling author with over 20, uh, 28 books to his credit and is a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post. He's an inductee to the Entrepreneurship Hall of Fame and has received numerous awards over the years and is a frequent speaker at some of the world's largest economic summits. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Steve Mariotti. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful uh, to be here. I have admired this school for like, oh, since I moved to New York 30 years ago. And I've gotten to be friends with many of your leaders and professors, and uh, I just think it's a great, great institution in the heart of one of the world's great, greatest cities, to me, the world's greatest city. So um, uh, I just envy you and, and just wish uh, the very, very best for you. I gave my business card out. I hope I gave it out to everybody. If somebody didn't get it, um, I'll give it to you when we're done, and I also have a book for you that I'll sign for you, and if there's any way that I can help you in a simple, clear way, uh, I will do that. So um, this afternoon, I invited some of the most interesting people um, that I know to talk to you about entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurship, particularly the entrepreneurial mind frame, how you view opportunities, how you think out of the box, and how that can really help your career, your family, and your community. And I want to start today with someone who's been my friend since 1988. You should be very proud of him. He went to um, school here, uh, did extremely well, and uh, went on to Harvard Business School. Uh, and then I met him, and he became a nifty volunteer for our programs in Newark, New Jersey. And he was an incredible teacher. And for the last 27 years, he's been <coughs> one of the top money managers uh, in, uh, of his generation. So, uh, Walt, I, Pearson, I hand uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Steve. Uh, see, I'm Walt Pearson, and um, I grew up here in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in uh, Williamsburg, uh, Bushwick Housing, housing Projects in Williamsburg. And um, I, w I started actually an entrepreneurial little venture. I was in eighth grade, and I was going to a school, which back then it was called Berkeley Institute which I think now is called Berkeley Carroll in uh, Park Slope. And in eighth grade, I started an underground newspaper that used to poke fun of the teachers. It's kind of like a mad magazine. And I got a kick out of doing that. And uh, my subscription started to excel and started picking up. But one, one of my issues, the math teacher was on the front cover. He got a copy of it and I got in trouble. And I had been suspended from school one time already. And they actually had kicked out my twin brother and so Mr. Stevens said, Walt, if I take this to the headmaster, you know they're going to kick you out. And I said, Mr. Stevens, I'll do anything not to get kicked out. Um, please don't take this to the headmaster. And he said, you know, I want you to spend some time with, uh, with me. And he was my math. He said, you're good in math, but you don't apply yourself. You clown around. And he said, there's something called Wall Street. You ever heard of it? I said, no. Um, I said, I hate reading Shakespeare, which I always got to read. Um, I said, you gonna make me read something else like Shakespeare? He said, no, no. He said, there's a book called Money Masters by John Train. I said, okay. He gave me the book and I read it and it was, I thought it was the greatest book I ever read in my life. And it talked about people like T. Rowe Price and Bernard Baruch, Warren Buffett, the greatest investors ever. And I was hooked. I said, Mr. Stevens, um, 
how can I get you? Tell me more about this. Can you give me some more information? And he started t talking to me about the stock market. And I said, Miss Stevens, I come from a poor background. I can't afford stocks. He said, well, why don't you start a paper portfolio? He said, what do you know? I said, I know IBM. I know AT&T. So I started tracking IBM and AT&T. A little did I know was Mr. Stevens was teaching me about the market, the lingo, and I started getting the background in stocks. And I started getting interested more in finance and accounting and economics and the stock market. Fast forward, I went to Brooklyn Tech High School. I clowned around there. Um, I was on a basketball team. My junior year, I started getting a lot of letters and started getting a big head and got a little rep around New York City. And then my senior year at Brooklyn Tech, we played a playoff game against Midwood High School. We were heavily favored, much better team. We had a very, our team was so talented that Lorenzo Charles, I don't know if you guys know his name, he hit the, a big shot for North Carolina State that won NCAA tournament for North Carolina State back when Jim Valvano was a coach there. Lorenzo Charles was a sophomore when I was a senior. He wasn't even good enough to make our team. We were so good. And that year we had beat Alexander Hamilton, which was fourth ranked in the nation. So we had a really good team and I was the best player on the team. And I was getting very cocky and we lost the playoff game to Midwood, a team we should have beat. And I was playing that game and I felt terrible when I was playing the game. I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I came home, I told my mother, she said, I think you got the flu. Why don't you just take it easy? Well, as it turns out, I kept regressing. And she took me to the doctor and they did blood work and I was playing that game with mononucleosis, didn't even know it. I had such a bad case of mononucleosis, I had to get hospitalized for a week. And when I came back to school, I had, when I came out of the hospital, I had to stay home for another couple of weeks. So by the time I came back to Brooklyn Tech, I had missed all the AU and all the all-star games. And all the schools that offered me offers revoked them, except for one school, and I was St. Francis College. They were the only school that kept their word. And I wanted to go to school and play basketball. I wanted to be a student athlete. So I promised my mother I would get serious about the books. And I always had this entrepreneurial flair at Wall Street, but I got very serious about the books and became a good student athlete. I ended up getting a job coming out of St. Francis, one of the highest paid jobs. And it wasn't on Wall Street, it was an investment analyst in Chicago. And I spent four years at Allstate Investment Department. I was the only non-MBA and the first African-American they'd ever hired in that investment department. Spent four years as an investment analyst. And while I was there, I took some classes at Northwestern Business School to get up to speed. And I always had a dream on one hand, a value goal on another to go to Harvard Business School. And you know, guys out of housing projects in Brooklyn didn't go to Harvard Business School, but I just had this dream. And I started, I was getting this, all this responsibility at a very early age there. And I said, what the heck? I'm gonna apply to Harvard Business School. And I actually had started a business in 1987 called Pearson Robinson Capital Management. And the Robinson part of that business was Craig Robinson, who's President Obama's brother-in-law, who obviously, obviously at the time was not President Obama's brother-in-law, but Craig Robinson is the third leading scorer in the history of Princeton basketball. We started a business together, Pearson Robinson Capital Management, and a gentleman who runs aerial investments now, John Rogers, put up the capital. I told John, I'm all for going all into this except one thing, I applied to Harvard Business School, and if I get in, I'm gonna go. And John said, when did you apply? I said, I applied the last pool. He said, the last pool is the toughest pool to get into, you'll never get in. He said, if you get a small little envelope, you know you didn't get in. So sure enough, a couple weeks later, a small little envelope came, I let it sit for a couple of weeks, and I finally opened it up, and it said, congratulations, you've been accepted to Harvard Business School. <laughs> and I had waited so late, so I had, could get, I actually got some, I was fortunate enough to get some scholarships, but the housing, I had to live off campus. I actually lived on the undergrad side. But I went to John and told him, remember I said, if I get into Harvard Business School, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this venture, I'm gonna go to Harvard. John was very upset and disappointed, so was Craig, but I went to Harvard. And it turned out to be the greatest experience of my life. Um, not only from the standpoint of learning, you know, a kid from the projects of Brooklyn go to small school, St. Francis College. I was in there with the big boys. And just to give you a feel of some of the people in my class, I don't know if you, most of you guys, at one time you said Blackberries, they were hot before iPhones became hot. But the CEO of Blackberry was a guy named Jim Barsilli, who was in my class at Harvard. Jim and I used to play basketball every Friday after class. I used to destroy him too. <laughs> and we would have a beer and a burger after we would play it. He would have all these ideas. I said, Jim, one day you're gonna make it big with this creative mind, you are incredible. And sure enough, he ended up becoming the CEO of Blackberry. And at one point, until the stock went down, he was worth $2 billion. Charles Slumberjay of Slumberjay Oil was in my class. The first CFO of Amazon was Joy Covey. She was in my class. 
The current CEO of Ford Motor Company is Mark Fields. Not only was he in my class, he was in my section. And when I was at, when I was at uh, Brown Capital, where I am now, we were trying to get into Ford. We couldn't get a meeting. I just emailed Mark. He said, come on in, Walt. Let's talk. And that's how we got a meeting. So the connections were made were incredible. And the reason why I'm telling you this is just the power of networking, if you're going to start a venture, is, is, is really, really powerful. Um, a lot of times, you don't have capital. You need some seed capital. And, and it can come sometimes from friends or places you never know. But to make a long story short, after Harvard Business School, I came to Wall Street and uh, spent 20 years working at large firms, majority firms. And my last stop was at Putnam Investments in Boston. And I didn't like it. And I decided that um, basically my, the, the Putnam got in some trouble. It wasn't my team, but the entire firm got hurt by this trouble that Putnam's, the international team, got into. So I told my wife, I said, you know what? I'm tired of working at big firms. I want to either start my own firm or work at a small firm. I decided to work at a small firm, Brown Capital Management in Baltimore, Maryland. We just hired our 35th employee and tell you what a small firm can do. And it's a very entrepreneurial a feel to it. We have 35 employees. We manage $7 billion. And Morningstar, which is like the highest rated agency rating mutual funds, they're, they're roughly eight to 10,000 mutual funds in this country. This little firm in Baltimore, Brown Capital Management, we got ranked 2015 the number one manager in the United States of America. And it wasn't based on one year. It was based on one, three, five, 10, 12, and 15 year numbers. Number one. We beat Fidelity, all the big boys, T. Rowe Price. And Eddie Brown is the epitome of what an entrepreneur is. And one thing he stresses to us is when you start a firm, you can't go into the notion of you want to be rich. You have the mindset of you want to create value. Transactions of mutual benefit. And value is created through taking care of your employees, taking care of your customers and clients, take care of a community, and then also take care of your shareholders. And that's what we've done. And I applaud you here for doing that. And I want you to be on the mindset of, if you do become an entrepreneur, there's a high probability you will fail. I mean, just give you a, a, a for instance, the Small Business Administration has stats that within the first five years, 50, over 50% 50 of people fail. The key is getting back up, and facing adversity and obstacles and trying again and again. And if you have a good plan of action and a support system, anything is possible. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Rodney Walker. Um, he's a graduate of, um, of um, Morehouse and Yale, and he's also a very proud graduate of NIFTY, an organization that I'll tell you more about later, but uh, works with young people and helps them start small businesses. And I'm very proud to say that Rodney's just completed a book uh, about his life that was last week number 25 on the New York Times bestseller list in the area of autobiography and was number two on the Amazon list uh, in the category of consulting. So I think that's the first of many books, and Rodney, we're really happy to have you here today. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. That was inspiring, by the way. I'm, I'm very honored to be on this panel. Uh, Steve invited me on this panel a couple weeks ago, and uh, I'm really, I really advocate more along the lines of uh, entrepreneurship education. Um, and what the entrepreneur mindset can do to inspire um, and really influence change and, and growth uh, with young people. Um, so, you know, just to be on this panel, is, like I said, is a great honor and a privilege. So I'm really appreciative to be here uh, with you all uh, this afternoon. So uh, this morning, I will say that um, the first thing that really drove me to entrepreneurship was obviously Steve Mariotti's business, uh, the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. And uh, I really like to to begin this and end this with a story that's going to be very brief um, that kind of tells just a working story of how I got involved in, in, you know, entrepreneurship education and, you know, my entrepreneurial endeavors. In 2007, January 7th, 
um, I had been at my parents' house for about two days. Uh, we were um, we were consoling and trying to repair what had been a 13-year gap of um, of absence. I had been in the foster care system since the age of five, and I had been through a dozen different foster homes, and I didn't know what my parents were, but I had the opportunity to find them when I was 17 years old um, in my senior year of high school. And uh, the end of my foster care journey was really, it was, it was traumatic because I had ran away from my last foster home and um, I had been through the social services, the legal system, and, and uh, for a while I had been on like the missing persons list in Chicago. That's where I'm from, born and raised. And the, uh, I had been on a missing persons report because I had ran away from my last foster home. And by the time I was found, uh, nothing could be done because I was pretty much uh, at the point where I could age out of the foster care system and do the, the independent uh, living program. And at the moment the police found me on the street at 11 o'clock at night, um, I was sent to a, a courthouse, the jailhouse. Um, and the person who picked me up from the jailhouse that night was a relative of uh, of my immediate family, and that was how I be I found out who my where my real parents were. So I went back to my foster home, and you know I got all this you know I got this argument uh, back and forth about why I ran away, and I was telling them why I ran away because it was a very toxic environment. Um, I had been advocating to go back home for the, the, all the 13 years I was in foster care because at the time I entered at five years old, I knew I was there. Uh, I had been displaced from my family. I have nine brothers and sisters. I had been displaced from them. Um, and I just wanted to be back to, uh, you know, be back with my family. And I think among all the things that can be a very devastating social, emotional, and traumatic experience, one of the the, the gravest things could be that you, the stripping away of your foundation. And for most kids, their foundation is their mother and their father and their, and their, their siblings. And so that was, the, that was the rock bottom for me, having that stripped away. So my life's work or my early career, so to speak, was getting back to the one thing that, you know, my, my heart genuinely desired, which is to be back, you know, with my loved ones and I did that, and I pursued that at the expense of not really understanding or gauging what it was that I was genuinely called to do in life. Uh, so that stripping away of, of the most essential thing that mattered to me was, the, uh, was really the crutch that I had to deal with going through my early days in education and my social, uh, my social well-being and my emotional well-being. I, was, I came into high school at a fifth grade reading level. Um, I went to summer school both my freshman and sophomore year because I had below a 2.0 GPA and I came into my junior year with a 2.1 and came into my senior year with a 2.4 GPA. So I was, you know, everything about my reality was broken. Um, and it wasn't until I had the opportunity to get back with my parents that I said, ah, you know, I, everything is it's a utopia now. Now I can really focus on what matters to me the most. Um, but the damage had already been done. Um, from a social emotional standpoint, I had become desensitized um, to all of the the ills within my life. And one of the things that I've understood about my own circumstances is that when you are desensitized, especially at a young age, um, that becomes your downfall when it comes to thinking creative and entrepreneurially. So I always miss that that nag for thinking outside of the box. And one day after I left my parents' house, um, I went into class. They introduced a business class in my high school called the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, Teach Young People How to Build a Business. I thought that was, that's a you know, great model. I would love to do that. I was a credit behind from graduating from high school. So I said, oh, okay, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and take this class. Um, and within the first week of taking this class, I had decided that I no longer wanted to be at my parents' house. I had came home that next week. I couldn't get back in my house for like a week straight because my mom had been gone for about a week. She had, uh, she had a huge crack cocaine and heroin addiction. And at the first of the month, when my dad would receive his veterans benefits from the VA, 
because he was a, a veteran of Vietnam War, um, 100% disabled, uh, she would take all his money, and she'd take all her food stamps, all her resources, and she would go on the other side of town and be gone for about a week. Never knew what she did, never knew how she did it, but when my mom wanted to get away, she got away. And um, I stayed at the school like 6 a.m. I went to school at 6 a.m. every morning. Uh, left the school at 7 p.m. after the basketball team had finished practice. And I went to the Olive Branch Mission Center, which was a homeless shelter about five blocks away from where I live for about a week. And it wasn't until I confronted my parents about the reality and their circumstances, what they had been through, you know, why the, the heavy substance abuse and what was, what was holding them back from recovering, uh, that I decided ultimately that um, I had hit rock bottom and I needed to build a new foundation. And thankfully that new foundation was entrepreneurship <laughs> education, but it was, more to, but it was also an intensive, critically engaged mentorship that was provided through that program. Um, by the second semester of my high school uh, year, I had built a business through the program, a video production business. Um, and I was built it with a team of friends in high school that, uh, that we literally went out into our communities um, and did basically music videos uh, for about you know, $500 at that time um, per video, which is a lot to us. So we, we did that. We, would, we started off with probably two events a month um, and then we started off, and then I went to five events, and then I went to 10 events. And um, ultimately, we used that as like leverage uh, and motivation to really, you know, build a solid foundation for that and pursue our education so that we can have more opportunities to do that. Um, and in the long run, uh, as I realized that I started to shift my focus more on my academics through the entrepreneurship education because I knew I wanted to graduate from high school and I knew I wanted to continue my business and hopefully continue it in college where I would have some free time, where I wouldn't have to pay any bills because I would be on campus. I wouldn't have to like worry about the day-to-day the -day living expenses because I can go to the college cafeteria and get my food. I can go back to my dorm and work on my project and my homework. Um, that college became my, you know, my most immediate foundation to be able to build my life back up. Um, so in a sense, in an indirect way, um, my journey through entrepreneurship really is what navigated me to the building, the initial building blocks uh, to rebuild my life in a more meaningful, positive, and productive way. Um, and it is because of that uh, initial foundation and that motivation that came from that, that I was able to use that uh, <clears throat> to really get creative and to get more motivated and inspired to pursue uh, education at Morehouse College, ultimately going to Yale University to pursue graduate studies um, and to be where I am today. So, thanks. <laughs> I was two when I met Steve. Uh, 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 many years, I'm very proud of you. Uh, you're one of our top young entrepreneurs and you graduate. I remember you graduating from, uh, from NIFTI and so I'm really proud of you have you here today Thank so if you. if you tell your story that'd be awesome okay uh good morning everybody good morning. um first of all i think we need to give this brother here a round of applause because you know that was that was some tough stuff he went through <clears throat> we could i could talk about a lot of different things but i'm going to be uh i'm going to talk about one thing specifically and then use uh my life as examples um, it's taking advantage of opportunities and creating opportunities. That's like the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, flower and the cake of entrepreneurship. Um, I, my story is a little bit different from theirs. Uh, my family uh, <coughs> sells illegal stuff, and uh, even my mom back in the day. And so I've always had that uh, entrepreneurship in my life, but I knew that I didn't want to do that. And so um, I had a, I always liked to write. And so I started writing my poetry and I published my book of poetry. And I was at an event and a man said, hey, you are very articulate. Um, I produce public access shows. Would you be interested in having your show? And so of course I took advantage of the opportunity. And within a week at 19 years old, I had a public access show on Manhattan Neighborhood Network called Young and Doing It. And I would interview um, random people who just had good jobs. And then I, sn I started sneaking into video shoots. 
And then I interview like fat, I interview all the celebrities, Fat Joe, Dame Dash, Jay Z, and I would literally just sneak into their video shoots. And so from there, um, I had got, I had taken advantage of another opportunity, and I had gotten a job at a newspaper called Harlem Overheard that teaches young people about uh, the process of publishing, and they actually uh, inspired me to start my own magazine called Young and Doing It. And uh, I went out and I got sponsors, Timberland Boots, um, Aniche Clothing, I'm sure a couple of you remember Aniche, um, Sony Pictures Classic all sponsored my, my magazine. And it was like a small little thing like Jet. <coughs> but um, I put it out, I made sure, you know, I got clearances from celebrities, I always had the hottest sneakers. And so one day, I was at an event, taking advantage of an opportunity. I didn't really want to go, but I went. And the uh, PR person from Foot Locker was there. She said, you know, we can provide you the sneakers for your sneaker section um, if you put our logo there. And so, you know what I said, you can also provide a couple dollars, too. <laughs> so make a long story short, you know, Foot Locker came on board and sponsored me. And um, I had a, 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 another business um, where I provided marketing solutions because I've always found it easy to get press for myself. And so I had one client, he was a celebrity hairstylist, and he would go on morning shows um, to do the hair for uh, Nikki Taylor from Essence Magazine. And so I said, well, how can I promote my magazine? And so it was the sneaker section. So I went on the morning shows and promoted the sneakers, and then I took advantage of another opportunity, and I met with a company called Rodell. They publish uh, Prevention Magazine. And to make a long story short, we worked to develop, I helped with them, or worked with them to develop a magazine. It never came out, though. But, um, but anyway, after I decided I didn't like the publishing business, well, the magazine business, because a lot of the money you make has to go into the printing, and I like to buy myself stuff. So, um, so I decided I didn't want to do it anymore, but the morning shows kept calling me to come on a show and talk about sneakers. Take advantage of an opportunity. So I called Foot Locker and I explained to them, you know, what the deal was. And, you know, we worked it out and they sponsored me to uh, go on morning shows. And so I used to travel America for seven years and promote the hottest new sneaker releases on the news uh, for Foot Locker. And then um, creating opportunity, um, Foot Locker started playing around with the budget, so I went and I got sponsorship from some of the sneaker companies individually, and man, I had a ball. I traveled America and I did my thing. Now, taking advantage of an opportunity, um, I was trying to get Five Hour Energy to sponsor me, and they said no many times, but you know, still, I just didn't care, because you know, I, I live by this rule with, every, with a bunch of no's, they gotta be a yes eventually. So, um, so the, she, she was, she lives, the woman from Five Hour Energy lives in Omaha, Nebraska. Remember, I, I'm traveling America. So I'm driving through Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, even though I wasn't appearing on a morning show there, I had, took her to lunch and she said, hey, we're doing this event at NASCAR. We, uh, and you should go check it out. It's a few miles from here. So I went to the event, you know, I had my truck full with sneakers. Um, and what they had done is they had paid for, they had paid, half a million dollars to turn the back of a tractor trailer into a game show stage. And so like, you know, with digital lights and it was amazing and like little video games and stuff. And it was a great attraction where that people were lining up for. And I, I recognized an opportunity. Um, the CEO of the company who built that digital activation was there. So of course, you know, I gave him a couple pair of sneakers and you know, he and I had been cool for a long time and we just developed a relationship. And I said, you know something? I know a lot of executives in the marketing world. You know, maybe I can help you out. Now, here's the way I do business. I would not suggest y'all do that, but this is how I do it. Like, the first time I do something for any client, I do it for free, <clears throat> like off the bat. I do it for free just to show them that I can do this and I can do it well. So anyway, I set up a meeting with them, and I think it was JetBlue. And the deal was, if I get the meeting with JetBlue, he had to give me an iPad. So I won my iPad, and um, he and I worked out a deal. And so right now what I do is I, am in, I do uh, new business. I help them get new business for a company called Brightline Interactive. Um, now, I want to uh, give you just a little bit of information on marketing. When it comes to marketing, 
um, the newer and the better is what's in. And so nowadays, companies need innovative, interesting ways to engage people with, at, at, at big events. So what Brightline does is we build digital activations, which is basically uh, digital, uh, digital games or, or any type of thing where, it can, where people um, at events like the World Series, uh, uh, Super Bowl, um, can enjoy it and then companies can benefit from all of the exposure. Taking advantage of an opportunity, uh, I'm sorry, recognize an opportunity. Um, three weeks ago, I noticed that there was a need in my community. I live somewhere in Brooklyn. I ain't going to tell y'all where. I think there's a couple stalkers in here. But uh, <laughs> um, I recognized an opportunity um, that there was something missing. I'm not going to say what it is because I don't have my license yet. But um, I started it three weeks ago. And I, from this business, I make literally between $100 and $300 a day um, providing a service to people that, that, that they really need. And that's another thing I want to say and I'm gonna conclude with is when it comes to, be, comes to being an entrepreneur, the best thing you guys can do is try to recognize an opportunity and recognize a need that people have that other people aren't covering or if they are covering that need, they're not doing as good of a job that you would do. And so uh, that's it, Michael Jackson. <laughs> 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 um, our next speaker is uh, Joe Selner, who's my uh, dear friend from Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, Joe's had an incredible career, movie producer. Uh, Tom Hanks's uh, creative director helped Tom uh, find um, Forrest Gump, uh, assistant to the president of Columbia uh, uh, Movies, a uh, wide variety of mid-size and small-size businesses and spent, um, uh, before he got his MBA at Yale, spent six years as a, uh, as a journalist and learned uh, to write very, very clearly. Thank you. Thanks. I am uh, Joe Seldner. <laughs> um, Rodney and I went, the only thing we share probably is that we went to the same business school, although you won't believe this, but he's younger than I am. Um, so I started out in life, uh, I went to Columbia undergraduate, I went to Columbia Journalism School, and then I became a reporter at the Denver Post. I'd never been west of the Mississippi at that point in my life and moved out to Colorado. <laughs> Great experience, um, worked for the two newspapers in town. After about six years, I said, I need to do something else, I need to make more money or have other opportunities. <laughs> so I went back and got my MBA at Yale, it was actually not called an MBA then. Um, and all my classmates were getting jobs at um, uh, McKinsey and First Boston and investment banks, and I knew I didn't want to do that. I would interview at Lehman Brothers or Goldman Sachs, I'd come back at the end of the day and my head would hurt, not because I couldn't understand what they were doing, but because I knew I couldn't do that day after day. So I said, what do I like? I like uh, sports, movies, and TV, so I sent a bunch of letters, there were letters back in those days, to um, uh, a lot of CEOs of entertainment and sports companies, and I got hired as assistant to the president of Columbia Pictures. I've always been entrepreneurial, um, but I had kind of a traditional path that I pursued for the first 42 years of my life. But at Columbia Pictures, I started a home video division and ran that. Um, after a few years, I realized that I need to be in Los Angeles and on the creative side of the business, and I had helped a classmate of mine get a job as creative executive to a young up-and-coming actor named Tom Hanks and she said well I'm leaving this job would you like to be interviewed for it and I said yeah and I went out to California I met he had just done big so he was an A-list guy at that point and uh, I had the worst case of laryngitis in my life and I'm sitting across the table from Tom and he's asking me questions and I'm barking like a seal he said where are you from and I Ugh. so I thought clearly I had not done well and at the end of the interview, he said, I like you, my manager likes you, you're hired. So I moved my young family out to California. I worked for Tom for about three years, great job. Th three of the first 20 scripts, my job was to find the next project for him. And I would meet with agents and producers, and I was the, he had a deal at Disney at that point. I was the liaison between Disney and Tom. And uh, three of the first 20 scripts that I read were uh, Dead Poet Society, Ghost, and Forrest Gump, all three of which won Academy Awards for Best Screenplay. Tom didn't do the first two, but thankfully he did the third. Um, then I did a bunch of other things. I was executive producer of a, a kind of an Entertainment Tonight. I don't know if that's still on the air, but Entertainment Tonight type, type show. And then I commuted between Los Angeles and Denver for a year. I, I started and ran a uh, 
news division of TCI Cable, which was the biggest cable division, cable company in the country. So I always had this entrepreneurial spirit, but I was doing things more intramural, more within the confines and and uh, comfort of a corporation. Then I I got divorced. I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> And had a, a very difficult divorce, but was very lucky to get sole custody of my children, who were then 11 and 8. So I moved them back to Princeton, where I'd grown up. I had friends there. The schools were good. I knew the territory. And being a single parent, I don't care whether you're male or female, is a difficult thing to do. Best thing I ever did. Very happy about that and proud of my kids. But I became – that entrepreneurial spirit went from within a structured organization to kind of juggling being very kind of chaotic, and I really I found that I really liked that. So I was writing a lot. Uh, I um, I spent had a stint writing um, speeches for the governor of New Jersey, John Corzine, who was ahead of Goldman Sachs. Um, I produced a couple of movies. I don't know if you're anybody here is a baseball fan, but I produced a movie called Sixty One that Billy Crystal directed about Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Did a couple of independent films, and really found that. Uh, um, starting new things and beating the odds was very satisfying to me. It wasn't necessarily financially satisfying, but it was emotionally and psychically very satisfying. And I think what Keante said is really uh, um, very valuable, that it's identifying opportunities. And sometimes those opportunities come from external sources. You see something in the market and you say, I can do a better job. Sometimes they come from within. You say, I've always wanted to do X, Y, Z. I'm going to do it. And you know, uh, the hell with what people say. Um, but I think identifying opportunities is an incredibly valuable skill and a necessary skill. And Steve had asked me to kind of share tips that I might have. And, and in addition to echoing what Chianti said, um, I would say another tip is learn how to communicate, learn how to write. Um, I'm, I taught a couple of classes at a local college, Rutgers and a couple of other colleges and was sort of shocked. I mean, a lot of very bright kids and they, you would talk to them and they would be very articulate and you'd have great conversations then you'd read their papers and wonder what happened in, in the interim between your conversation and the paper and a lot of, of not very clear communication. I think that's an essential skill. I think that everybody in this panel has that and everybody in this panel would agree that that's a necessary thing in the in the workplace. Um, and I would also say, you know, kind of th this, this is cliched but sometimes cliches are true is um, don't allow yourself to be defeated. Don't allow yourself to be discouraged. I mean, you're going to be discouraged. That's going to happen. But don't allow yourself to be defeated. And if you think you have a good idea, you know, the thing about good ideas is sometimes they're really good ideas, and sometimes they run up against the wall, and the wall is telling you something that it's really not a good idea. And I think as, as important as recognizing opportunities, you have to recognize sometimes that the great idea that you had for 15 years that was boiling within you may not be what the marketplace needs or wants. And the ability to adapt and shift uh, course very quickly is very, very important. So that's it. Thank you. So I'll just take five minutes or so because I'm dying to hear the questions you have. And if... Um, you have any business ideas or businesses uh, going on. But um, again, I'm Steve Mariotti, and um, I uh, started off in, in business at Ford Motor Company and uh, spent uh, three years there. And then I went into my own business in 1979, did that for three years, loved it. And um, I got mugged in uh, September of 81 uh, during a crime rave wave here, here in New York. Um, some of you may remember it, but it was kind of a big deal to me. And I got therapy for it. I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And I had a lot of really cool friends and professional help. And they advised me to uh, go uh, become a teacher as a way to work out this anxiety that I had, which was chronic. I couldn't really think about anything else other than the fact that I'd been humiliated and hadn't acted the way I thought I would act. Um, so I became a high school special ed teacher in um, uh, 1981, uh, October, late October, and walked in first day, Boys and Girls High School, which at that time was a very intense school, uh, but I loved it. I, I Within an hour, I, I just thank God, I said, I, I think I found um, something that I want to do the rest of my life. And sure enough, uh, 38 years later, uh, I'm still in the field. I'm very, very proud of it. 
but I spent eight years as a uh, elementary, junior high, high school teacher. I taught at Rikers Island, uh, uh, Gene Adams, um, uh, Boys and Girls High, um, all the schools that were having a lot of problems, the principal would ask for me, and I would go, and they would give me the kids that weren't doing well. And usually they were kids that had really hard lives. They didn't have money. They weren't good in sports. They didn't have friends. They didn't do well in math or English. They had ter you know, really low self-esteem. And through, many times through no faults of their own. In fact, I would say in every occasion through no fault of their own. And they were sad. They were depressed. And they would act like tough, but deep down they were in enormous pain from feeling like they, they, they failed and that society had failed them. So I, I began to think, talk, and write uh, constantly about that issue um, from 1981 uh, till 87, 88. And I was in a classroom at Rikers Island and uh, teaching night school at Jane Adams uh, in the South Bronx. And I started to teach kids how to start businesses. And before that, I'd been a math uh, special ed teacher. But one day, I just walked in. I took off my watch, and I, I held it up, and I said, how much money would you pay for this watch? And the kids, the young people, had been really disruptive and making fun of me. And it was just a very difficult time for, my, for me as a teacher, because uh, they didn't really respect me or anything. <laughs> But immediately they changed, and that began my, my career, my, my second career as a teacher. And from that moment on, um, I, I started to practice 15, 16 hours a day teaching basic business concepts that are usually taught at the MBA level or uh, at a junior, senior level at a great school like this. They're usually advanced concepts, net present value, business planning, uh, financial ratios, basic sales, negotiations, opening a bank account, debt versus equity, franchise versus licensing. And all these things, the educational establishment would say, oh, you can't do that. That's wrong. They're never going to learn that. Uh, but they did. And it became a huge success. And uh, a wonderful man came out to see me, Jaime Escalani, who was in the movie Stand and Deliver. He heard about my work and that I was in trouble uh, with the school board. And he came out to see me, and he stayed with me for three days, and I went out and saw him. And he was my lifeline. He, he said, if I can do it in calculus, you can do it in entrepreneurship and business. And around 85, uh, 1985, 30 years ago, I guess, I said, I'm just going to gut it out, and I'm going to focus on teaching the children of the world how to start a business and how to own assets so that they can control their lives, they can control their communities, help their families, build hospitals, build great universities, build great cities, that they're not just workers. Not that there's anything wrong with being a worker, but I want every child in the world have a choice to know enough about capitalism and free enterprise and the basic principles of it so that they decide whether or not they're going to be owners or workers, which is a huge decision in, every, in everyone's life. 87, uh, I wanted to start my own organization. Um, there was a very wonderful large organization named Junior Achievement, incredible organization still in existence. But I knew I couldn't compete with them. They had a half a billion dollar budget, and my budget was $800 starting out. So I said, I'm going to focus on one word, which is entrepreneurship. I'm going to focus in teaching young people how to start a small business. I'm not going to teach anything else. And, and also ownership, how do you own something? And I'm going to write my own textbooks, and I'm going to do my own teacher training, and I'm going to be friends, but I'm also going to compete with Junior Achievement. And I told them that. They were very kind to me and very helpful. And I'm very proud of the fact that 
we named it and in a classroom in the South Bronx, uh, NIFTI, which is, stands for the Network for Teaching uh, Entrepreneurship. Uh, I think we're gonna have a partner with this great school. Two of our top executives are here. I hope you'll stand up. I don't mean to embarrass you, Tess. And, and Tess, if you could introduce uh, uh, um, <coughs> I, I apologize, I couldn't pronounce your name, but uh, what, what's her name? Oh, beautiful, I apologize, it's a great name. So uh, we've grown every year since 1987. Uh, I would argue we have been one of the most successful replications of a youth program in the world in the last 50 years. We have teachers in um, 50 countries, offices in 11 countries, and uh, offices and licensees in 17 cities in America. And we have 600,000 graduates, 12,000 trained teachers. Our office is right over at 120 Wall Street. I hope um, you'll um, uh, try to go over there. Uh, we try to keep a very open community. Uh, you can buy the books, you can study on your own, but if you can get into a class, we have, without question, in my opinion, the best uh, high school and um, uh, even junior college uh, teachers in, in the world, I think. I'm very proud of that. But the most important thing I think Nifty did over the last 30 years is we changed how people view children that are born into difficult situations. We also, I think, were seminal in changing how people view human beings that are in crisis or in trauma. Um, I've always felt that it, uh, the children of poverty, children of pain, adults of poverty, adults of pain, people that are going through hard times, which everyone goes through, everyone at some time in life drives into a wall. And it's really what you do about it that distinguishes you. No one escapes it. No one escapes it. And I think we helped a little bit change the perspective on that, that a setback, a failure, a tragedy, a mistake, uh, uh, loss of momentum, a depression, loss of a friend, a change, a movement, a bad grade, a disagreement, magnitude of human uh, uh, problems and <coughs> obstacles, we, we view those as opportunities. And if you can train your brain to view, view it that way, that no matter what happens, there's an equal or greater benefit. And almost every great fortune in the world, uh, from uh, the Rockefellers, the Fords, uh, to uh, uh, Bloomberg, every single one of them, including all the businesses, I believe, in this wonderful neighborhood uh, here, um, if you trace it back, it, it'll go back to some pain some uh, need, some lack, something that the person, the entrepreneur, or their community uh, needed uh, or, or didn't have. And um, it's also an incredible motivator if you trace it back. Pain can be a, a, a beautiful, beautiful thing when it's turned into a motivator. So I, I wanted to end there and encourage you to check out Nifty's website. Uh, we, we do work primarily with junior high and, uh, and high school kids, but it's a very good organization to stay in contact with and to be aware of. And I, I do want to give you three quick tips uh, that you already, which you already have not heard. Um, one is counterintuitive, never, never, never compete. Never compete. Find out what everybody else is doing and then don't do it. And ideally, find out what everybody else is doing and then try to sell something to them. Whenever you're directly in competition, particularly in a large market where a lot of people are selling corn or, or the same product, you end up a commodity and there's almost no profit in that. So you always want to be a little bit different. <clears throat> um, the second thing is make sure you plan. 
planning and thinking through what is going to happen in a small business saves you a ton of money. You never want to be in a situation that is totally new to you because you haven't thought about it. Most plans don't come true. That's part of the beauty of it. But the process of planning is invaluable. So make sure that you buy a book um, um, or, or take a class here or learn the basic principles of planning because it is, it is a really, really important uh, a craft. And the last thing is similar to Joe's, but subtly different. Um, when I started Nifty, I had $800. It's now globally, I think, uh, I think it's a 17, 18, 19 million dollar budget globally, and with a 13 or 14 million dollar endowment, I think it's going to grow a lot more uh, in the future. Um, so I couldn't buy anything. I didn't have uh, a budget for advertising. I didn't have a budget even, I didn't do my own logo. Uh, it, was, it was, on one hand, very stressful. But on another hand, it forced me to think, to bootstrap, to force myself to get things done and to build very small teams who would work for very little uh, to, to, to help me. And one of the ways that I was able to break through from a budget of $800 to, in the second year, a million dollars, and in the third year, $4 million, which is incredible growth, was I used media. And I got very, very capable at finding stories. And a story has to be true. Um, and, and it has to have drama in it, true drama. So I would find stories of, of young people that had changed their lives through business. I would tell my own story. I would tell teachers' stories. And I would pitch them to media constantly on one page, three paragraphs. And after a couple of years, uh, a guy called me up, Peter Jennings, who was a famous ABC News anchor. and. He said, can I meet you for a cup of coffee? And he said, I've got seven stories that you've pitched here. And he said, I'm going to do two of them. And the budget went from a million dollars to three million in about four months. He put, he put us on national television twice. And then he said, that other story you told, I'm fascinated by it. So I'm going to put you and that child in that story, and I'm going to put it on 30 times a day for one month, for one minute. It became their person of the year, or whatever they call it. And that added another million and a half to our budget. People would see it, and they would say, what is that? I want to give money to them. Media is the most powerful way to communicate an idea to other human beings. It's free. And it's free. So it's an honor to be here today. You have a wonderful school. Professor Anderson, what a friendship we've got. And Mary and I appreciate it being invited. And I hope all of you will stay in touch with all the five of us. I would like to open it up for a couple questions and or if anyone has a business that they want to, uh, to discuss. That would be fascinating. I just want to know how did you guys um, gain sponsorship and how did you propel your vision to these sponsors to believe in you to take the next step? Well, a bulk of uh, the money I make comes from corporations and corporate and, and the marketing department of corporations. So I can answer this question for you. The first thing you want to do is you want to, this is what I, I can tell you what I did. I built a list of uh, of as many people and from different companies, and, as well as their title, their email address, and their phone number, and I developed a relationship with them. So when I had my public access show, um, this is back when I first got into Nifty, what I would do is um, I would uh, buy uh, 15 
to 20 minute tapes, cassette tapes, and I would just send it out to them. And so for instance, with a Nietzsche, um, I don't know if any of you guys remember Nietzsche, but um, it, it was founded by uh, Tony Shellman. And um, I basically would wear their clothes on my show. And then, so when I went and started my magazine, I made my development a part of their development. I made my success their success. So when I started my magazine, I asked Tony for $10,000. I think he gave me two, but that was still a win. So the best advice I could give you is initially, you wanna to try to develop a relationship with these people without asking for anything major. So say for instance, if, I don't, what's, your, what's the business that you wanna do? About teen pregnancy, okay. So, uh, to get, well, if it was me, I would reach out to Essence Magazine. I would reach out to, um, I mean, not to be funny, I, I, this is a stretch, but uh, you know, even possibly the uh, <clears throat> condom companies, and just and and what you do first is say, for instance, with Essence. You say, hey, I'm going to this place and I would like to take some copies of your magazine to the event. This is what I did with the Source magazine back in the day. Um, I was doing uh, uh, a uh, block party event that was sponsored by Sprite. And I went to the Source and they became the, uh, the media sponsor. And they didn't put up any dollars, but they came with uh, uh, a SUV with uh, music playing. And they bought a ton of their magazines as well as a, as well as a bunch of CDs. So then when I went on to become the sneaker man and, you know, I had the sponsorship from Foot Locker, I went to the source and I said, hey, you know, would you, like, would you guys like to come on board? And I got a check from them. You understand what I'm saying? So, like, the first thing you do is you don't, people make the mistake of always going to these corporations and immediately asking for a check. And you just, that's just like, say, like, if, you know, you hit the lotto tomorrow for $100,000, you know, to be honest with you, you're going to get tired of people constantly calling you, asking you for money. So you ask them for something that doesn't hurt so much, and then you move up to the money. Now, which how you ask for the money is an interesting thing. You can either, you know, come straight forward and submit a proposal, and or like I did with the Nietzsche is I took the guy to lunch, and I explained to him what I was doing before I even launched the, biz launched the business so that, again, my success could be, he could feel like my success was his success as well. I mean, does that answer your question? Sorry, let me stand up for this, because <laughs> I really get passionate about stuff like this. Um, teen pregnancy, um, to follow up on what he just said, um, along with building those relationships, um, and this is something that me and Steve was talking about the other day, you really have to be, um, you have to be very succinct um, and very passionate when you're relaying your message and your vision so that people can really understand where your passion is coming from so that they can then support and really reach out to you for those relationships. On the subject of teen pregnancy, so I, you know, I was laying that my mom had 10 kids and she started at 13 and she didn't really know any better because her mother had her at 13 and then her mother had her at 13. So I have actually, we have a generational and I have a younger sister who had her first child at 16. So and we all grew up in foster care. My mom grew up in foster care, and then her mother grew up in sort of a foster care. It wasn't really foster care at that time. And so we have, I have generational uh, circumstances where my mother and her siblings and things like that were subject to teen pregnancy because of a lack of knowledge, because of a lack of nurturing from parents um, in a community um, that really infiltrated that type of uh, reality to happen in the community. So in a sense, if having somebody, having someone who has a, who's dealing with a community of people who in a sense can be broken in a, you know, in a way, um, and are subject to teen pregnancies by a number of different factors, not just from consensual sex, but also rape and things of that nature, to be able to communicate and relay a vision to people who can be your potential sponsors and investors and your dream and your vision is very, very critical. And I think that aside from building those relationships and having the right people at the table when you relay your message, I think the power of your vision is among the most important things that you have 
when you're trying to raise money and when you're trying to have people support your foundation. It's the, because the business that you're involved in is something that's, um, that deals with a lot of pain and a lot of trauma. You know, this is, we're not talking about necessarily college readiness and preparation. I mean, we're talking about women who are, and men who are, are subject to circumstances and the reality that's in a lot of ways beyond their control. Um, and I could just go back to kind of my own, my own circumstances when I'm also raising money and I'm really relaying my vision. You know, you have to just meet people where they're at. And, and because your target audience is young women and, and perhaps some young men who are subject to teen pregnancy or having early parenthood, um, it's going to be important to show on the most aggressive, uh, in the most ground aggressive way, your value um, and why you have such value in relaying this kind of service. Because it really is, there's a lot of people who, um, who for a lot of reasons don't have the luxury of having that education. Um, and so understanding and relaying the message of why the education is so important and how you can be able to provide for that, I think is one of the most critical things you can do. So. Looking back from when you started your, your companies, uh, do you gentlemen believe that you would be in the positions you are in today, as in like a position with connections and power? I'm working for a small minority-owned firm now, um, but what I can tell you all, you guys have, guys and gals have an incredible advantage that you probably don't realize. I tell this to my children, and they think I'm crazy. So I said, I, I have such advantages over you when I grew, grew up, and they said, how could I have advantages over them? Because my kids are very privileged and spoiled, and I grew up in a housing project. But you know what? You grow up poor, smart, and hungry, it takes you a long way in life. Grit and discipline takes you a long way in life. And that's the advantage I have over my kids. And um, that's what you keep in mind, because I hope you all watch, watch Shark Tank, because that's a great show. And it has so many ideas that somebody identifies a need or a service, and they just take it and run. Um, so I'm, I, I'm still, I, I would still be doing what I'm doing. And there's sometimes where I, I think about starting on my own, but what I'm going to probably do when I retire is give back and teach and coach and mentor, which is what I really am passionate about and touching lives. There's no question I'd still be doing what I'm doing. But everything I want to throw out to you guys also is how important it is, save your money. Don't get caught up in cars and clothes and jewelry because you, if you have these ideas, there's going to be a come a time where you're going to need capital. And having access to capital is really, really powerful. There's a gentleman I went to business school with named Alan Bond, who started a very successful minority firm. He was one at one time the largest minority-owned money management firm in the world. And Alan's problem was he gave up all the equity to outsiders. And because of that, it made him greedy. And he got greedy, and he did something illegal. He ended up serving 12 years in prison, federal prison. So when you give up your equity, your baby, it's hard to go to work saying, this is my baby, and I gave up all equity to something. But if you have your own capital, at least most of it, it's just a different mindset for you. So I would just recommend that as well. Can I, can I just add one thing? Don't, I'm sure all of you are, it's a very different generation from Steve's and mine, certainly. But don't be afraid of changing careers and changing direction. Um, I mean, I think that there's something, that's, that there's a statistic that people nowadays have five different careers during a lifetime. I'm not sure if that's high or reasonable, but um, because of life circumstance or opportunities, you'll, you'll see, you'll shift directions more often than you might have thought when you were 25 or 30 years old. And don't be, don't be shy about doing that. Often it leads to, as Keontae was saying, other opportunities and um, other connections. And I think that it's important to know that there's that flexibility and adaptability are really crucial to the entrepreneurial mindset. And if I could say one thing, um, to answer your question, um, I don't regret anything that I've ever done in my life because everything I do, I do with my whole heart, my whole soul. But here's the one thing that I do regret. And it's not listening to the people who were smarter than me when they were giving me advice. You know, sometimes you can be like, you know, that man in America be so beautiful and wonderful and intelligent to you because it's you. But at the end of the day, you're not the smartest thing in the world. You're young. You don't know everything. And 
really try to take advantage of people who are way smarter than you. For instance, like um, I recently started a publishing business and um, I've been writing my books. I write a bunch of, I like to write, that's like my hobby. And so I've tried to turn it into a business. And so I've been emailing Steve, who's written 20 books, you know, for advice. And Steve has been very helpful to me. And then to piggyback off of what the brother down there said, um, I had written one book that I wanted to make into a graphic novel. And because I don't, I'm not like a, like I could have like big jewelry and like a fancy car, but I got a regular car. <clears throat> and so I was able to invest $15,000 into one of my books. Like I had the money, you know? So um, just like always just try to listen to people who are older than you and who are smarter than you. Like even sometimes they could be a little long winded, but you can get like, <laughs> No, it's true. It's true, Steve. Um, <laughs> you know, but sometimes, you know, from that that 30 minute lecture you'll get, you'll get like one juicy morsel. It's sort of like when you buy cheap cookies and you're looking for that one little chocolate chip in your mouth. Same thing. <laughs> All right, a quick administrative note. Um, lunch is going to be served right after this, but before we get there, uh, I'd like to thank Steve and the panel he put together and the panelists. Uh, not so much for the title, Power of Entrepreneurship, but um, what I got out of these stories uh, that were told here today was something very deeply personal. They each shared something uh, very personal uh, about themselves, and um, to me, the, the thing that came through, shining through, was their drive, uh, their commitment to education. Um, and really, if I was to rename this panel, I would rename it the power of dreams, because they shared their dreams with you. And, um, and I hope that they ignited uh, your own dreams to go forward. So with that, I'd like to give them a big round of applause.